Hello, Namaste and praise the Lord. I trust God that you are doing well. I hope that you're enjoying your Sunday service and I hope that God is speaking to you. Okay. Uh, I am so thankful to God that He is leading us in these amazing ways. He's encouraging us in these strange times, in these tough times which we are facing. Before I share what I have in my heart for you all, I want to just quickly recollect what Cunning spoke to us last week. He spoke to us about how do we really value people. He spoke about that we should have four major pointers in doing that, that we should thank God for them. We should pray often for them. We should be patient with them and we should love them. And when we do this, we would really want to uphold the value we have in our church, that we would love God, honor God and love people. In lines of loving God and honoring Him, I would like to share what I have in my heart with you all. Uh, I was reading about these tough times and I want to respond and I want to share with you all from the Bible what God laid on my heart about responding to tough times. I was reading in my news in my mobile app that this year has been the year where the maximum number of people movements have taken place. People have shifted themselves, uprooted themselves from one place and shifted to a different place. Some have done that among cities, some have, some have done that across states and many of them have turned from their, from their working, uh, working professionalism from cities to their villages and they have vowed never to come back to the city because the city has been so, so harsh to them, it has been so difficult for them to live in these times. Today, I would like to take, from, take with you on a journey in the Bible on two examples, two of many examples in the Bible where people uprooted themselves from one place and went to a different place. And when we look at those two examples, I hope to encourage you with some biblical principles of about facing these tough situations and tough life values. In the Bible, usually tough times are associated with famines. Famines are time when there is no rain, there is no water, there is no food, the economy crumbles down, the kings are misplaced and uh, kingdoms uh, come crashing down and people look to move to different places for new, new opportunities and they look to move from one place to a different place in order to have a better living. Let's look to our Bibles and if you have your Bibles with you, turn with me to Genesis chapter 12. And I'm going to read from verse 10 onwards till verse 20. This is one of many examples in the Bible we found, we find about people moving from one place to the other. So let me read. Genesis 12 verse 10 onwards. Now there was a famine in the land. And Abram went down to Egypt to live there for a while because the famine was severe. As he was about to enter Egypt, he said to his wife Sarai, I know what a beautiful woman you are. When the Egyptians see you, they will say, this is his wife. Then they will kill me, but will let you live. Say that you are my sister, so that I will be treated well for your sake, and my life will be spared because of you. When Abram came to Egypt, the Egyptians saw that Sarai was indeed a very beautiful woman. And when Pharaoh's officials saw her, they praised her to Pharaoh. And she was taken into his palace. He, the Pharaoh, treated Abram well for her sake. And Abram acquired sheep and cattle, male and female donkeys, male and female servants and camels. But the Lord inflicted disease on Pharaoh and his household because of Abram's wife Sarai. So Pharaoh summoned Abram and said, What have you done to me? He said, Why didn't you tell me that she was your wife? Why did you say that she is my sister? So that I took her to be my wife. Now then, here's your wife. Take her and go. Then Pharaoh gave orders about Abram to his men and they sent him on his way with his wife with everything he had. Notice, Genesis chapter 12 is the chapter in the beginning verses 1 to, 1 to 5, in the beginning few verses where God speaks to Abraham of being a blessing to the entire world. He tells Abraham that, you know, whoever blesses you will be blessed, whoever curses you will be cursed, and you and your offsprings will be the reason for joy and simulation and abundance to the ends of the earth. 
Yet when the famine comes, this very man who was in that promised land leaves that promised land and goes to a different land called Egypt. In fact, when, he, when we see the Bible, his generations repeat the same thing again and again. Abraham's son Isaac, when we read in Genesis chapter 26, there was another famine in the land. So this time God had to actually speak to Isaac and say, don't go to Egypt. He goes to some other place, but in, he ends up doing the same mistake or he ends up repeating the same error which Abraham did. He calling his wife, his sister. And then we go around after a few years, again in the life of Jacob this time, in Genesis 42 and 43. This time, again there is a famine. And even though God's providence is there in Joseph, uh, the entire family of Jacob's come, Jacob comes from the promised land, settles in Egypt. They were supposed to be there for seven years because the famine was supposed to be for seven years. They ended up being there for 430 years. You see, in all of these three situations, there is a somewhat similar pattern. There is famine, tough situations to live life in, then they travel to a different location, and then they either, either compromise or they suffer. And then they, they, they take their own adventurous journey to come back to God and worship Him the way He is supposed to worship. That's one example. Now let me give you one more example. This time a positive example of somebody responding to a crisis situation, somebody responding to famine and drought, but in a different way. So turn your Bibles to 1 Kings chapter 17. And I'm going to read from verse 1 to verse 9. Now, Elijah the Tishbite from Tishbe the in Gilead said to Ahab, As the Lord the God of Israel lives, whom I serve, there will be neither dew nor rain in the next few years except at my word. Then the word of the Lord came to Elijah, Leave here, turn eastward, hide in Kirij Ravain, east of Jordan. You will drink from the brook, and I have directed the ravens to supply you with food over there. So he did what the Lord told him. He went to Kirat Ravine, east of Jordan, and stayed there. So the ravens brought him bread and meat in the morning, bread and meat in the evening, and he drank from the brook. Sometime later, the brook dried up because there had been no rain in the land. Then the word of the Lord came to him, Go at once to Zarephath in the region of Sidon and stay there. I have directed a widow to supply you with food. As you look into those, these two examples, I believe we can look at some, these two examples with a perspective of learning. And I'm going to draw out some biblical principles. They, they are not the only principles, but I feel in my heart that this is, the, what, this is what God has for us in this week. And the first point I want to share with you is that in tough times, wait on the Lord. Psalm 27 verse 14 says, wait for the Lord. Be strong, take heart, and wait for the Lord. You see, on, in all the three examples of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, God is known as the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Yet all of these three men have given you examples of how they've shifted from one place to a different place. We saw a pattern in their shifting. One crucial thing missing in that pattern was them waiting on God, listening for His word, and then moving. That's the one key thing which we saw in Elijah. The word of the Lord came to him. And then, the, and, and then Elijah did what the word of the Lord told him to do. That's one key thing missing in the previous examples. You see, the previous three people ended up having to either compromise or suffer. But Elijah ended up not only being a blessing, but he himself was able to bless people. And uh, this is the difference between these two examples, the word of the Lord. I want to encourage you, my brothers and sisters, to wait on the Lord, to wait on a word from Him, to hear Him, to seek Him. Uh, the word of the Lord is the lamp which we have in our feet. It is the light into our path. Even though the path is narrow, it is short, it is difficult. The word of the Lord gives us direction to move. We as a family, we are right now living in that situation. We are waiting on God for something in the new season of our life. And I want to encourage you all, if you are waiting on God 
for a new season of your life or if you are expecting a new season in your life i would really from the bottom of my heart would want to encourage you that you wait for the lord god will speak to you you should hear the word of god you should hear god and then make any decision make any kind of choice in psalm 27 the same psalm which david writes if you read the whole psalm and i would love you to read the psalm 27 after the service maybe in your family devotions read the psalm you will realize that david is writing this psalm in a very very difficult situation he is in a tough spot he writes that he's surrounded by his enemies he's sometimes he's feel, feeling that he will come down anytime soon and when he's writing that he's writing that psalm not with fear he's writing that psalm not with low keenness but he's writing this psalm with some amazing confidence in god one of the verses is verse 5 he says for in the day of trouble he he means god will keep me safe in his dwelling place he ends the psalm actually by these words which i quoted wait for the lord be strong take heart and wait for the lord it is it is difficult sometimes when we are in the waiting period but i am telling you what is worth it it is worth waiting for the lord and if you are facing a difficult situation this is the time to cry out to god and ask a direction from him ask and you shall receive if you are, if you do not know how to ask this is a good time to have jesus in your heart accept him as his lord and savior because without that it is not possible to hear the one true god the one true god will live inside of us if we accept him as our lord and savior he is the one who is the author and finisher of our faith he when you cry out to jesus he will speak to you for sure i am fully convinced of this that if you cry out to jesus he will talk to you and he will talk to you in a way you understand and when you understand you will move in the spirit of god you will move with the word of god and you will move in the power of god i was reading an article in this in the magazine called christianity today and this article is by uh, mr isaac shaw it caught my attention because of the sheer amazing ways god leads okay so let me quote from that magazine this is a uh, mr isaac shaw writing i know a local church community in rural north india that has been struggling even in the best of times so here's a church which is struggling despite showing genuine love and concern for the community around them they have continuously faced opposition and threats now when covid-19 hit india the local police showed up at the doors of the church the pastor was apprehensive but this is what the police said the police brought a risk request from the government for the church to make 1000 cloth face masks and this and to use the center of the church as a distribution center for the community and the officers the police officers accompanied the pastor to a local cloth shop and opened for them this particular shop specifically for them to buy the material what the police did not know was that this church the pastor and the people of the church were praying and waiting on god in ways to responding to this pandemic the lord answered their prayer and he opened up an opportunity to serve the community and also to better the relationship with authorities god works in amazing ways if we can just wait upon him that was waiting on god next i want to say in your tough times do not compromise please do not compromise abram told a white lie and that white lie is that his wife is actually his sister it actually it's something called as white lie okay he the the lady was related, related to abraham but for sure this is something which we use normally white lie and the descendants of abraham started from that white lie and ended up doing n number of things isaac said that did the same thing and jacob when they and the and the descendants of jacob when they were staying in egypt did i don't even know what they did but they ended up being slaves to egyptians 
they ended up marrying Egyptians. They ended up losing the sight of God. It starts small. It starts with something very, very even unnoticeable. But it ends up in a destructive manner. Please, I would recommend, do not, do not compromise. The Bible talks in Romans chapter 12, verse 2. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. What do you think, my friends, is the pattern of the world? The pattern of the world is basically in the New Testament, when they use the word world, it refers to the world system, the way the world functions, the way the world talks and behaves. That's the pattern of the world. And the Bible has a lot to say about these topics. And, and what I felt to share with you a small list and that small list is found in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 11. It says, bitterness, ill temper, anger, fighting, slander, hatred. Then, the, then there is this obvious of lying and cheating and murdering and stealing and killing. I want you to introspect in your life right now and answer this question. How many times have you been angry for no reason? How many times have you slandering your own people when you're staying in the house how many times you had a situation where you had to say white lies these are the situations where you began to compromise and once you begin to compromise you will never know when to end to compromise and I know that I'm talking something really difficult and radical but that is what it is we are called to live radical and different lives. We are not called to conform ourselves, ourselves to the patterns of this world, but we are called to be in this world, salt and light, by renewing our mind daily, in and out. So I want to encourage you, my friends, do not conform yourselves to the patterns of this world, but be transformed in the renewing of your mind. In your tough times, my dear friends, do not compromise. Please, I beg of you, do not compromise in any other space. Let's look on to the third point. Okay. Let's turn to 1 Kings chapter 17 and notice verse 7 and verse 8. It says, Sometime later the brook dried up because there had been no rain in the land. Then the word of the Lord came to him. I want to talk to you from this word about relying on God for sustenance. My dear friends, in your tough times, rely on God for your sustenance. I like imagining things and I like visualizing stories when I read the Bible stories. So if I were to imagine and visualize the story of Elijah near that brook hiding in that cave and uh, the, the raven swiggy community delivering everyday bread and meat to him, I would imagine that every day he would go out with his, with his plates and the raven delivery boys would give him the food he needs, meat and bread, morning and evening. And then whenever he was thirsty, he would go out to the brook, collect some water for himself and, have, and enjoy the providence of God, the provision of God. But as days goes by, we, I would notice that Elijah is noticing at the brook and the brook is shrinking and shrinking and shrinking, becoming smaller and smaller as the days goes by. It resembles sometimes my bank balance, okay? In the start of the month, it is something when the salary comes in, but every week when you monitor the, the bank balance, it becomes shrinking and shrinking to a point when it becomes zero. And I know some of you can relate with me right, the way I'm speaking. It is, it is the way it is. And then, I want, I'm wondering and imagining if I'm Elijah. God, you brought me here in this brook. You told me to come here and you told me to hide in this cave and you told me that I have ordered the brooks to give you food and water. Now what happened, Lord? I'm running out. I'm running out of my resources. I'm running out of my providence. God, is this really what you wanted me to do? And many times we end up asking this question, Lord, I am been following your word. I have been doing what your Bible says. I have been doing the right things at the right time. And I have been following your word to the T. Yet, Lord, my providence is going down. 
Yet, Lord, I am facing a job cut. Yet, Lord, I am facing a salary cut. Yet, Lord, my finances seems to be shrinking and shrinking and shrinking. Yet, Lord, my relationship seems to be shrinking and shrinking and shrinking. Yet, Lord, I have no idea why am I running dry, why everything is going empty. Probably Elijah was thinking the same thing. But verse 8 gives me a lot of encouragement. He tells me again, the word of the Lord came to him and told him, go to a widow. And I have ordered the widow to give you food. He, and we all have heard the story of how the widow was about to have the last meal and die. Her plan was to make the last meal for herself and her son and then just uh, give off living. But God made these two people meet. And when they met, God was glorified in their providence. God was magnified in that miracle of that oil not running out. What do I want to prove in that? I want to bring you to a point that, you know what? Ultimately, God is our provider. He is Yehovah Jireh. He is the one who provides for us. Sometimes we tend to believe that our job or our abilities or our skills provide for us. That's not true, my brothers. God is the one who provides us. He is the source of every good thing which we have. So in your tough times, I want you all to rely on God for sustenance. Do not rely on your own understanding. Do not rely on your skills. Do not rely on what you consider as your strength. But I would encourage you, rely on the Lord because He is El Shaddai, God Almighty, God All Powerful, and He is Yehovah Jireh, the one who gives us providence, our provider. Amen. Last point I want to give to in front of you. And remember, always remember that God is in supreme control. In your tough times, it is very easy to forget who is in control. It's very natural to be tempted to take control ourselves. It's very worldly and the world tells you that. It, the world tells you, come on, be a man. Own up responsibilities. Do this thing. Do that thing. Be a man. But the moment we take control ourselves, what we are saying is, you know what? I can do this by my own strength. I don't need God. And I want you to go and remember, my friends, that God is in supreme control of whatever is happening. He has always been in control in the past. He is right now in complete control. And He will always be in complete control of entire things. He is the one who created the universe. At his breath, things have moved. He is in complete control. Oftentimes, when we look at our circumstances, our situations, and uh, the situations which we are facing, and when we plan something and things don't go the way we plan, we find it difficult to trust in God. And we find ourselves tempted to not have peace. Nevertheless, it's it's okay. Whoever asked God, God, why, hasn't yet got the answer. There was a man named Job. And when I read Job, and when God starts to speak to Job, Job says, Oh Lord, I am just a man. I am just a man. That is what it is. God sees the bigger picture. He sees the purpose of every little detail in our lives. Whenever we start assuming and overthinking details and live our lives as if it is supposed to be in our strength, we fail. But every time we look on to God and every time we look on to Him and assume and understand that He is in complete control, it gives us immense peace. Shalom it gives us. It is good to remind ourselves that God Almighty is on the throne seated still holy, still worthy, still the Lord of universe, still the Lord of hosts. Lastly, I want to encourage you 
by paraphrasing one of the one of my favorite bible verses it's found in romans 8:35 and this is my prayer and my encouragement to all of you let me read this out to you romans 8:35 and this is my own version of it i'm not blaspheming but this is what something i feel is relevant to us for i'm convinced that neither death nor life neither angels nor demons neither the present nor the future nor any powers neither height nor depth neither a virus or a disease nothing else in this creation will be able to separate us from the love of god that is in christ jesus our lord nothing can separate us from the love of god nothing absolutely nothing can separate us from the love of god allow me to summarize what we've just heard we're going through tough times and i want you all to pray in your families for people who are going through some really really difficult times we already have a prayer list with us and do spend some time earnestly seeking the lord praying for them in your tough times wait on the lord the bible says those who put their trust upon the lord shall rise up like an eagle you see when you rise up like an eagle every big mountain you see from ground up becomes a small ripple from sky down wait on the lord in your tough times my brothers do not compromise please do not compromise do not be conformed to the patterns of this world but be transformed in the renewing of your mind trust the lord and do not compromise for any kind of temporary gain thirdly rely on god for sustenance he is yahova jaira our provider el shaddai who is all powerful remember that god is in supreme control of our lives the bible says in romans chapter 8 for all things work together good for those who love god and are called according to his purposes i hope that god has spoken to you and that you are encouraged by listening to this and by watching this may the lord bless you may he make, may he make his face shine upon you god be with you and to jesus be all the glory and honor amen